we're going to turn to Psalm 10. This psalm has no title, unlike Psalm 9 and Psalm 11. Um, and yeah, as I said before, in the other time, many think it's actually the second part of Psalm 9. Anyway, um, Psalm 10 uh, is, uh, like Psalm 9, uh, also an acrostic psalm, meaning the first letters of each verse, each sentence, um, in this case follow the, the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 9, the first half of the alphabet, Psalm 10, the second half. Now, these are all reasons to uh, assume or suggest that Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 are one and the same. But <clears throat> on the other hand, Psalm 9 is truly a song of praise, whereas this psalm is one of lament over the seeming prosperity of the wicked. But it ends in confidence in the judgments of God. There is a clear transition from one to the other. <clears throat> As, um, that's the reason why I put this uh, arrow on the right side uh, in this diagram. And uh, you see also clearly how uh, the psalm is divided in two halves. One questioning the su success of the wicked, the other prayer for protection and vindication. And really ending in confidence in the Lord. So it starts verse 1 with the following. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? David poses a question we all have on our hearts as believers, sometimes at least. When we see the wicked flourish, and uh, yeah, then it really seems that God is far away, even hidden. The presence of God is the joy of his people. But when he seems absent, it's concerning and it's disturbing. What's most concerning is not the actual trouble, but the seeming absence of God in the midst of that trouble. And this feeling of concern is, is especially um, amplified in times of trouble, as David also writes here. And the word he uses here for times of trouble is also used in Psalm 9, verse 9. And um, there are very few places where this is um, used. I think it's, these are the only two in the Psalms. It's the word tsara. And it expresses great distress, despair, actually, when there is no hope of deliverance. So that's the, the sentiment here in verse 1. David continues then to write... Um, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasted of his heart's desire, and blessed the covetous whom the Lord abhorred. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So we get a better understanding why David was troubled by the seeming inactivity of God. And we get this understanding when, from the way he describes the wicked. He says the wicked is a proud man. He persecutes the poor. He approves other sinners. He blesses the covetous, it says, the greedy. And he renounces God. God is not in his thoughts at all. He does not seek God at all. Actually, as Psalm 9 said, he tries to forget God. Someone who renounces God is sinful. We easily agree to that. However, here it says that someone who does not seek God and who does not think of God is equally sinful. And that should make us think twice. The question could be, do we actually seek God actively and continually. What we see here is that there is no neutral ground. There's no middle ground. You're either for God or you're against him. Man has obligations to God as his creator and neglecting them is sin. It's a sin committed in pride. God is in none of his thoughts. At the same time, the man of God cannot stop thinking about God. The prayer of David uh, towards the wicked is that they might be caught in their own plots. 
In Psalm 9 verse 15, David shows his confidence that this is how it will end. Here it is his prayer. He continues then to describe the ways of the wicked in verse 5. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgment are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. We read here in the King James translation that his ways are grievous, that's oppressive. And other translations say prosperous. Well, it's quite different, but at, at the same uh, token, um, it shows that he seems able, the wicked seems able to do what he does, uh, thinking that the judgments of God cannot touch him. They are far away, and he makes even fun of his enemies. But David is not complaining. He's not saying if only God would pour out his judgment, the wicked would change. No, David is actually acknowledging God's authority. The wicked can only prosper because God allows it, and they can only prosper as long as God allows it. And in his prideful heart, he thinks that he can never be touched. Verse 6 says, the sin is in man's heart. Verse 7 says, his mouth is full of it. It's under his tongue. Cursing, lying, threatening and evil speech proceeds from the mouth of the wicked. The sinner who thinks he is untouchable. So David continues in verse 8. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor. When he draweth him into his net, he croucheth and humbleth himself, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. Now, although the wicked thinks he is untouchable, as described before, we see here that he often operates in secrecy. He is lurking in secret places, verse 8 says, and his eyes are secretly fixed. Verse 9, he lies in wait secretly. And in verse 10, he crouches low, he lies low. The wicked always needs secrecy and darkness. It's actually a hallmark of wickedness. And we see it in secret societies. They are secret. Uh, we see it when um, most evil, most crimes happen at times of darkness. And we see it, of course, also very much uh, today when we see how Wicked people hide themselves in tunnels underground, in secret places. Ephesians 5 verse 12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And the wicked goes further than speaking evil, as we read before. Eh? His, um, his uh, mouth is uh, full of cursing <clears throat> and, and uh, deceit and fraud, and under his tongue is mischief. And uh, vanity. He goes further. Here we read he actually murders the innocent, the helpless. He doesn't fight those that are able to fight back, but he goes for the helpless. And the word used for helpless here uh, in this psalm uh, is, um, is found several times. Eight, uh, verse 8 and verse 10 and verse 14. The poor, it's translated here. It's lehalka uh, uh, in Hebrew. It's the poor, the helpless, the miserable. It's really those that are uh, not able to defend themselves. In verse 11, he continues then to say, He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. Evil speech and murders are made worse because the wicked man mocks God, saying in his heart that God has forgotten and will never see him in his wickedness. And this makes him a blasphemer too. Man often thinks that God has forgotten their sins because they were committed long time ago and nothing has happened. Well, sins may be forgotten by men, but they have eternal consequence and are thus not forgotten by God. David was offended by the blaspheming sinner who mocked his God. 
And you see here the contrast between David, who in verse 1 fears that God has forgotten him, and the sinner here who falsely takes comfort in thinking that God has forgotten him. In verse uh, 12 then, David begins to plea for intervention. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine heart, forget not the humble. After the observation of the wicked, the psalm turns into a prayer. The prayer is simply for God to take action. Arise, O Lord. It's the same battle cry that we read before in Psalm 3, verse 7, in Psalm 7, verse 6, in Psalm 9, verse 19, and it will come back in other psalms as well. It's a, it's a battle cry. And um, although David was a man of action and he was a warrior, um, some things are left uh, to the Lord to deal with. And David recognized that. Uh, we have, of course, the example where David would not lift his hand against Saul because he was uh, in a, Saul was in a place of um, God-appointed authority. But David did pray for God's intervention. He continues then in verse 13, Wherefore doth the wicked contend God? He hath said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. So there's a question here, and right away the answer. Why does the wicked renounce God? Because he thinks God will not require an account. Well, the long-suffering of God is not uh, to give the sinner time to continue, but uh, actually to work repentance. But many, many will not take it like that and will instead get more hardened in their iniquity. Because there are no immediate consequences, the wicked one thinks that there are no consequences at all. That's a grave error. The prayer is here for God to bring it to an end and to require an account now. And this is amplified in the next verses, verse 14. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite, to requite it with thy hand. The poor committed himself unto thee, thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man, seek out his wickedness, till thou, thou find no more. David has observed the mischief of the wicked, but he also knows that God has seen it and that God cares about the trouble and the grief of the poor and the helpless. He knows and he prays that God will repay it, all this with his mighty hand and break the arm of the wicked until there is no wickedness left. Then the psalm takes an, uh, on another um, turn, you can say, in the last uh, verses where um, David recognizes God for who he is and this gives him also confidence. It really um, makes uh, this transition from despair in verse 1 to full confidence in the last verses. Uh, verse 16, it says, The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Like David, we may at, time, at times feel that God is far off and may even have forgotten us. But we can actually be confident that he reigns as Lord and King. He calls him King here. And not just uh, for a season, but forever and ever. And although David was being persecuted by the King uh, of Israel, King Saul, and even though he was anointed to become a king himself, he knew that God was the true and eternal king. And that was not a new thing. Uh, that was already proclaimed <clears throat> by Moses when uh, he uh, says in verse 15, actually he sang, it's the song of Moses, Exodus 15 verse 18, The Lord shall reign forever and ever. The Lord is the ultimate and eternal ruler, the king. So we may um, look up to or even suffer under earthly kings or presidents, but we have an eternal king who stands above them all. Yes, the nations have perished out of his land. For David, this was, of course, more um, practical and recent history as um, the, uh, the nations had been driven out of Canaan. 
when God um, gave the land to his people. He continues in verse 17, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. Here we see a wonderful principle at work. It says God prepares the heart. That's the first thing. The second thing is that God suggests the prayer. And then it says that God hears what is prayed. And God answers the petition. A prayer that comes from a heart that is prepared by God is heard by him. And no one can prepare the heart but God, if only we allow him. As an old writer says, it's far harder uh, work to raise the big bell into the steeple than to ring it afterwards. The hard work and labor is a lifting up of the heart. It's a very nice picture. Once there is a bell up in the steeple, it's easy to ring it for uh, attention, for alarm, for whatever cause it may be. Once the heart is uplifted, it's far more easy to call out to God than when it's not. And David had such an uplifted heart, but he goes a step further. He doesn't say that God has heard the prayer of the heart, but he says God hears the desire of the heart. Even those desires that we cannot express or that we do not dare to express are heard by God. After all, he prepared the heart. It says in Romans 8 verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, a note on this verse, uh, because it's often uh, used in a totally different context, it says here that the Spirit intercedes, not the flesh, not the person, the Spirit intercedes. And it says also that the spirit groans, not the person, not the vocal cords of the person, the spirit. And it says that these are groanings which cannot be uttered. If it says that they cannot be uttered, it means they are not uttered. It's only the spirit who makes them known to the Father. But these are the, the needs and desires in our heart that we are unable to utter. Then in the last verse of uh, Psalm 10, it says, To judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. So, we see here that David has confidence in the sovereignty of the king of kings, in verse 16. And then in verse 17, he says that God is Lord over all. And here he speaks about the just judgment of God. There will ultimately be justice, and the wicked will oppress no more. They are but men of the earth, and they will know it, just as the last verse of Psalm 9 declares. And that day will come. It will come soon. And then the question of verse 1 is answered. Amen. Amen.